so uh this lecture is uh i believe coming in a best possible moment for us it's uh, it's also like a consolidation of what we have done uh, in the last 10 years but i wanted to show you and uh, i believe that you're all very uh, familiar with the current situation uh, concerning uh, energy problems in the world uh, so i think it's very appropriate to cite professor mark copper who, who recently said that uh, electrochemistry was always a promise but now it seems that it's our only hope uh, so i also would like to add here that uh, we strongly believe that conductive polymers and materials which are derived from conductive polymers uh will have a very important role in in, the, in this process for finding uh, new energy uh, conversion and storage solutions uh so uh okay uh so uh i guess most of the people that have some contact with electrochemistry know that electrochemistry has a has a different solutions for energy conversion and storage uh and uh we have to be honest because uh there is a, like a really big hype currently in the market uh saying that uh batteries are better for example for 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 electromobility or the fuel cell so there is there there is kind of battle between uh batteries and and hydrogen uh but uh, as i said we, we really have to be honest and say that okay so some solutions are better for certain applications other solutions are better for some other applications uh for example lithium-ion batteries are probably better for small cars but if, if we consider like big trucks or trains or uh, then hydrogen comes comes to its place uh but uh, traditionally we can consider that there are four uh, I mean, yeah, let's say it's three actually uh, main types of energy conversion and storage systems that electrochemistry deals with. So we have super caps or super capacitors or electrochemical capacitors, and we have batteries and fuel cells. And when we consider capacitors, uh, there is, let's say, no real chemical reaction. Uh, so energy stored in, in this kind of system is dependent on the capacitance of double layer and the voltage in, the, in, in which we work. Uh, however, with uh, batteries and fuel cells, there is like a real chemical reaction. So we have some reactants, we have some products, we have very well, well, very well defined change of, of, of the Gibbs free energy for a given reaction, and then we can link. Uh, the thermodynamics of the cell with with uh, the voltage and uh, the energy and so on. Uh, it's as I said, there are different types of these energy conversion and storage systems, uh, but uh, in principle they cover different ranges of specific power and specific energy. So this is very important to consider uh, when looking at specific applications and searching for for, for materials. Which can be used in these uh, in these energy conversion systems. Uh, so, if we look at the capacitors, there is a, uh, there is a charge store, charge storage or energy storage, uh, basically in the electric field which is formed in the in the, uh, the interface between the material and uh, the electrolyte. Uh, so in principle the energy which is stored in this system depends on the on the, on the, on the scale of, of, of double layer capacitance uh, but in principle there is also another ways to improve this uh, energy storage capability through some pseudo paradigm processes which takes place so this is some uh charge charge exchange and there are some redox reactions on the surface uh, for electrochemical capacitors, it's always important to have like a really uh, concentrated solution so, the, so that we do not have large losses in the electrolyte. Uh, if you look uh, on the other, at, at the other systems like uh, batteries and fuel cells, we, as I said, there is a real chemical reaction taking place on the surface. So what we need there is to have active sites uh, which are capable to perform the reaction that you're interested in. 
so for example, if you look at the fuel cells applications for, for different materials, we need places uh, or the active sites and material surface uh, where oxygen re reduction reaction can take place. Or for example, if, if, you, if you talk about batteries like lithium ion batteries, we need some material which can accommodate uh, lithium inside or sodium if you talk about uh, post lithium ion batteries. Uh, so when looking at the specific applications, we really have to think uh, about the properties of our materials. But in principle, all these electrochemical uh, energy conversion systems, uh, they require some very uh, common properties of materials which are used there. So what's extremely important for, uh, for electrochemical energy conversion is that we have good electrical conductivity. Uh, this is essential because this material which, which is placed at the electrode and give, gives some performance, uh, it also acts in certain way as a, as, a, as a current collector. So basically the charge has to go through it if it's not, if, you, uh, if electrical conductivity is not very good, then the performance will be lost. Uh, then we also need some adjustable properties like uh, morphology, surface chemistry, where the reaction takes place. So they will have some pseudo-faradite processes uh, in, for, for electrochemical capacitors. Then, uh, of course, it's very interesting to make a comp composite material. So it should be uh, it should be easy to, 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 to perform some, such, such kind of synthesis and, and also other properties. And then the, our focus comes uh, to conductive polymers uh, because, because they mainly have all these, all these desirable properties. And uh, this talk will be primarily focused on the polyaniline and polypyrrole, uh, which we worked with for the last 10 years. But we also have to be aware of some limitations uh, of these materials. So in principle, uh, they have some uh, limited electrical potential window. So it's also possible to have some irreversible chemical changes. So they lose performance. Uh, they're pH dependent, the electrochemistry is pH dependent. Uh, and uh, what we should also be aware is that uh, electrochemistry for energy conversion is, is usually taking place under very harsh conditions. So it's either highly acidic media or highly alkaline media. It's important because of the losses, energy losses in the electrolyte. Uh, there is also quite frequently very high anodic or very high cathodic potentials. So we have to be very careful when we work with, with conductive polymers because they can uh, change their properties irreversible and basically we can kill our energy conversion system. Uh, another possibility is to produce carbon materials from these conductive polymers. Uh, of course, then we lose some good things. I mean, we lose this specific uh, molecular structure, but carbons are generally uh, good electrical conductors. Uh, and uh, when we derive these carbons from uh, from polyaniline and polypyrrole, uh, they usually contain a large concentration of heteroatoms, like oxygen, which is present basically on every carbon surface at some percent. Uh, they contain nitrogen, which is considered as very important uh, for energy conversion applications, particularly for capacitive applications and energy and uh, electrocatalytic applications. In principle, these carbons have very well developed pore structure, which can be improved by some post synthetic modifications. And they are electrochemically well uh, stable. So this is very important for us. Uh, and then we can also have a look where we have found some possible applications of, of different uh, conductive polymer, uh, polymers, their composites and carbons derived from, from, the, from, from these conductive polymers. Uh, so if we look at just uh, conductive polymer, then, then we can easily apply it for electrochemical capacitors. And uh, it's also possible to apply, apply it for some electrocatalytic applications, including uh, metal air batteries. 
then we also have uh, another possibility with uh, making composite materials with PANI and uh, polypyrrole. Uh, and we can, again, apply these materials for electrochemical capacitors, for electrocatalytic applications. Uh, met in metal ion batteries, I would say not that much because it's a really specific chemistry taking place there. Uh, but then uh, other possibilities open uh, with carbonization of these materials. Uh, so with carbonized uh, PANI and polypyrrole, we can use these materials for electrochemical capacitors. We can use it in electrocatalytic applications. Uh, again, with batteries, there are some questions uh, if we talk about metal ion batteries, because in principle, these carbon materials, they do not interplate uh, metal ions. Uh, and then finally, we can make composites of carbon, carbonized uh, conductive polymers, uh, and then we can use them for many different applications. So I believe that this uh, slide is, is a little bit confusing, but in principle, it shows us that we have a really large number of possibilities uh, for searching for, for new materials and different applications when we start just from conductive polymers. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the rest of the lecture, I will just show some examples uh, of what we did uh, over the last decade. And uh, then I would like to give some kind of a, a, of a, of a short critical discussion how uh, we should proceed further. Uh, so I'll start with, uh, with some examples of uh, conductive polymers used for electrochemical capacitors. Uh, and this is an example that we, uh, it's a study that we performed together with Professor Walder from, from Switzerland. It's about uh, aniline polymerization using coarse radish peroxidase. Uh, it's a not very common, uh, not very common approach to, to polymerize uh, aniline, uh, but it's really interesting because uh, depending on what we have during the synthesis, we get really different properties of these materials. And in principle, if there are some template vesicles uh, present in the solution, we can get either conductive or non-conductive uh, polymer as a, as a result. And uh, what we were really happy about is that this uh, conductive form uh, of PANI that we got during the synthesis had really high capacitances. Uh, so in principle, if you look at these cyclic voltammetry curves, uh, it's not rectangular as one would expect for, for uh, capacity, super capacitive applications. But there is a, a very narrow window where these uh, redox processes they are taking place. So in principle, you can get material which has a capacitance of uh, 700 farads per ground, which is really high and appreciable value, uh, which you can use, for example, some, for some hybrid devices. Uh, so that would allevi alleviate uh, problems of uh, typical double layer capacitors and you get more energy stored in the system. However, as you can see here, there is really high dependence of electrochemical behavior uh, versus pH. And this is problem. So in principle, uh, we will have to focus on really uh, highly acidic solutions if you want to use these materials. Another problem is that it, it can be over oxidized and it can easily lose performance. Uh, so we should be very careful with it. Uh, then uh, we could also uh, show some examples of polypyrrole and carbonized polypyrrole used for electrochemical capacitors. Uh, and uh, here we show how uh, polypyrrole is converted to carbon. Uh, so there are very prominent changes in the Raman spectra. Uh, however, what is really interesting and what's important is that morphology is preserved. Uh, so basically, there are some uh, polypyrrole nanotubes uh, which are during the carbonization converted into carbonized polypyrrole nanotubes. Uh, and uh, an important thing is that it retains a significant amount of oxygen and nitrogen after carbonization. 
Uh, of course, the species which are present and the speciation of oxygen and, and nitrogen in the final product is different versus uh, the initial material. Uh, but this is very useful for, uh, for electrochemical applications. So what we could actually see is that uh, capacitance increases really nicely and we got some values which are approximately 200 parts per gram. It is still much lower than, uh, for example, poly uh, polyaniline that I showed previously, which had capacitance around 700 parts per gram. Uh, but this is uh this is carbon material and you can use it in different electrolytes and you can expose it to very high uh, uh anodic potentials and it, it will preserve its properties so there are significant advantages uh in terms of stability but uh, capacitance is uh, a little bit lower okay so uh, one more example from uh, collaboration with our colleagues from czech republic patricia Bober. Uh, is this wonderful example of uh, bunny aerogel carbonization to carbogel. Uh, so these materials uh, are really astonishing because they're super light, mostly con cons consisted of, of air, uh, which also makes them very difficult to, uh, to measure electro electrochemical properties. Uh, but uh, not only that, the, the morphology is preserved in the shape of this, this uh, paniarogel during carbonization. There is only just some shrinkage uh, of material, but you also see that, that uh, during the carbonization, a uh, specific surface is being developed, uh, pore diameter changes. Uh, so we get a really nice material uh, which can be used for electro electrochemical applications, in particular for uh, as electro material for electrochemical capacitors. Uh, but the question is how it actually works. Uh, and then uh, we always try to link some of the properties of these materials uh, to their physical chemical properties. And again, you can see that depending on the carbonization temperature, the electrochemistry of these materials is really different when you go to, from, from acidic solutions to pH neutral to uh, highly alkaline solutions. Uh, and uh, it's really interesting that there is a dip in uh, gravimetric capacitance uh, when you go from non-polymerized, uh, non-carbonized material to carbonized material. Uh, so basically at the beginning, uh, we have material which con uh, contributes to capacitance through the uh, pseudophoretic processes. And at the end of carbonization, we have material which basically uh, stores energy in the double layer. Uh, but especially interesting is that Actually, this, this, this can be correlated with the spin density. Uh, so at the beginning, we have, uh, we have uh, high spin density, a very low specific surface. At the end, we have uh, low spin density and very high specific surface, I mean, in, in the series. Uh, so this can explain uh, why materials, why, is the, why there is a, such a trend uh, in gravimetric capacitance. Uh, and uh, another example coming from our lab uh, is car carbonized polyaniline, uh, again, for electrochemical capacitors, uh, which shows that depending on dopant, uh, we can have very different behavior. So in principle, how this behavior can be understood, uh, it's pretty difficult because we have a lot of data and we have to extract what we consider as the most important and try to correlate electrochemical behavior uh, with some uh, with with some of these uh, physical chemical properties uh, so in principle what we saw during the, the studies during the last 10 years so, so it's important what are the mesopores uh, their volume uh, how many heteroatoms are there uh, and so on but in principle uh with these small small data sets we can just give some hints what might be might be important uh in overall these polymers and polymer derived carbons they have uh interesting properties a lot of uh, experimental conditions influence their performance uh and we have capacitances up to uh i don't know like 400 farads per gram for carbons, but for composites, we can get uh, even 1,000 farads per gram.
Uh, then we can focus uh, the, the, uh, the, the electrocatalysis and uh, the composites of uh, po conductive polymers are really interesting. And this is an example of uh, funny gold composite. At, at that point, it was uh, it sounded like a good idea because gold was cheaper than platinum. The situation is now different. Uh, but we can see that in principle, it works even in alkaline media where PANI should not be uh, should not behave the best in principle. Uh, but we also see that there is some uh, relatively low selectivity. So the, so, so the so oxygen molecule is mainly reduced uh, to hydrogen peroxide with certain contribution of uh, complete four electron reduction. Uh, another example is a uh, silver panic composite, uh, which is certainly a better choice than gold. Uh, because silver is still much cheaper than gold and uh, platinum as well. Uh, and these composites also show very, uh, very distinct behavior depending on, on the pH uh, in which electrochemistry is investigated. Uh, and here you can see that uh, in, in, in alkaline media, there is basically no response if you, uh, if, if you just look at this uh, part where silver doesn't have any ele significant electrochemical response. But uh, there it is. So silver is present uh, to a significant extent. And in this case, uh, this funny component serve as a, as a catalyst support and conducting network and current collector. Uh, what is really good is depend that depending on the synthesis conditions, you can get a material uh, which is highly selective for complete reduction uh, of oxygen uh, to water molecule. Uh, and uh, uh, a case of, uh, again, of carbonized polyaniline, uh, this time for electrocatalysis. Uh, so you saw some examples of the same materials used for electrochemical capacitors. And now we use it for electrocatalysis. And this seems uh, that, I mean, this proves that uh, these carbon materials are really versatile. Uh, so we can see that uh, morphology is largely preserved. So we have... Uh, Nano rods, nano tubes, nano sheets, depending on the morphology of the precursor, we have uh, we have uh, heteroatoms, nitrogen incorporated in the, in in the structure in the surface, as seen by the XPS, and we get different properties of these materials. I mean, in terms of textural properties, and uh, this is certainly reflected uh, on uh, electrocatalytic performance. So, in this series of materials we can actually optimize this, the synthesis so that we can either reduce oxygen to hydrogen peroxide or we can reduce it to water, which is really uh, useful for, for, for different applications. And this uh, electrochemical synthesis of hydrogen peroxide became especially interesting during Corona time. Uh, but then again, there is a question, can we understand how these materials behave? Uh, so we can correlate different properties of these materials. Uh, we can correlate uh, some combination of these materials. So uh, looking at only these three examples, we can see that, okay, there might be something with uh, the surface of mesopores. There might be something uh, indicating that nitrogen content or certain species, nitrogen species are important, uh, but we still cannot be sure. And still in the literature, there is no consensus about the role of nitrogen uh, in terms of electrocatalysis uh, on carbon materials. But there is also an, an, an interesting, uh, rather interesting thing showing that there is, there is, a, there is an inter interplay of capacitive and electrocatalytic properties. So they're not uh, mutually independent. Uh, so there is, a, uh, so, so the properties which determine capacitive behavior are largely affecting uh, also uh, electrocatalytic catalytic performance. And this is, uh, this is essential uh, to understand. Uh, before uh, giving, uh, uh, how to say, like a critical discussion of <laughs> how, how we believe that we can uh, continue, uh, I would also like to show the, the final example where we use these carbonized uh, polymers, carbonized pani, uh, as, a, as a support for uh, platinum-based uh, nanocatalyst for uh, 
fuel cells applications. Uh, so you can see here at the TEM that uh, we have this nice morphology of uh, carbonized pani nanotubes. And in contrast to just carbonized pani, which is active for oxygen reduction reaction in alkaline media. And if someone says that carbons are active for oxygen reduction in acidic media, I, 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 I would be very suspicious. Uh, in, in this case, you see that uh, this catalyst, which has platinum nanoparticles, is now active in acidic media and in uh, alkaline media for oxygen reduction. So we can use, choose different uh, fuel cell technologies uh, for, for the application of, 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 of such a catalyst. Uh, what's interesting is it actually, we found it more active uh, than uh, than commercial catalysts, platinum platinum carbon catalysts, uh, which don't still don't understand. We believe that there is some uh, very important effects of the morphology uh, for diffusion and so on, and also the role of heteroatoms in, in, in the surface. Uh, but there is also a question how to how to proceed further. Uh, and uh, my personal experience uh, in, in the field of electrochemistry as an author and also as a reviewer uh, and someone who follows the literature is that most of the electrochemical papers are written in the same way. So there is basically some kind of template uh, circling <laughs> around. Uh, I'm not sure, but the structure of, 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 of these papers are usually like this. So you have uh, synthesis description, then you have characterization, it's always the same technique, so we need some innovation there. Uh, then electrochemical experiments, and then some attempt to link materials properties to performance, if, if there is any such thing in the paper. Uh, we did the same thing, I'm not saying that we are any, any better than this. Uh, but there is also another problem that as a rule we assume that material properties are unchanged in electrochemical conditions compared to uh, the conditions under which we, we characterize this material. And for example, uh, if you do XPS, there's, there are high vacuum conditions. In electrochemistry, you have solvent, you have extreme electric fields at the interface and so on. So I, I really doubt that material that you see uh, as, as you see it by XPS is different from material that you see uh, that shows uh, electrochemical performance that you actually investigate. Uh, so, uh, we do have to switch to some in-situ techniques, uh, which I believe that are, are, are the next step in, uh, next step closer to the understanding. But then there is also another, another possibility. Uh, as, as I showed you, we all, always have some small, relatively small data sets. Uh, and in these data sets, we say we can comprehend behavior of material, uh, but this doesn't capture a big picture. Uh, so what we are trying to do right now is to big uh, uh, to build a big data sets and then use some advanced anal analysis to like statistics in its basics, but then, then also like neural networks, machine learning, and so on. Uh, and and I strongly believe that data mining is very problematic because the data are inconsistent. Uh, so different groups test materials in different ways, and then you then it's very difficult to to to, to use these different sets of sets of data. Uh, in the same model. But uh, the possible solution is actually uh, some kind of standardization or characterization of electrochemical testing properties. A lot of has been done in this uh, standardization of testing protocols for, for fuel cells uh, because technology is more advanced than generally uh, supercapacitor technology. But, but for example, this is also very important. Let's test all the materials for electrochemical proper, uh, electrochemical capacitors in the same way. So we can have a synthesis condition, uh, materials characterization data, electrochemical performance, we can feed it in the model, then we can get predictive and explanatory models, and then we can uh, rationally design and select our catalyst uh, and materials generally for electrochemical applications. Uh, so I'd like to thank the Science Fund, which gives us money to do, do research. And I would also like to invite you to submit your papers on uh, conductive polymers and their composites for electrochemical energy conversion and storage to synthetic metals. Professor Cheris Marianovic and I are guest editors for this issue. Uh, there is a deadline on December 15th, uh, so a little bit more than a month. 
hopefully we can extend that, but you're most welcome to submit your papers there. Thank you very much. And I would hopefully, well, there is no more time, uh, but if there are any questions, I will definitely try to answer. Thanks.